Hi there, Agroecology 103 fans. Uh, today we have a, a unique opportunity, maybe more unique for you than it is for me, as I'll explain, uh, to talk about Should I Eat Meat with Dr. Diane Mayerfeld, who is the Sustainable Agriculture Coordinator uh, for the uh, state of Wisconsin and is part of U UW-Madison Extension. Welcome, Diane. Great to be here. Why is it not such a unique experience for me? Well, we're not wearing masks and we're sitting close, close together. That's because we live in the same house and we do that because we're married <laughs> to each other and we find it more convenient. We do. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's great to be talking to Diane, not just because I enjoy that every day, uh, but because she is writing a book which is very relevant to this question. Uh, the book is called Our Carbon Hoofprint, and it'll be coming out hopefully next year uh, from Springer. What's the subtitle of the book? I actually don't know. The Complex Relationship Between Climate and Meat. Oh, okay. Well, that sounds like a pretty important thing for us to try to delve into uh, today. So I know a little bit about the book, we've talked about it some, and I know that basically you cover three different agricultural systems and their relationship to this question, right? Well, three responses ah, to three the responses. problem okay. posed by the fact that livestock have greenhouse gas emissions and actually have a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions. And those three responses are one, yeah. well, if livestock emits so many greenhouse gas gases, yeah. why don't we just stop eating meat? Right, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Two is the what I call the efficiency argument, which is that the way we produce livestock in most of North America yeah. and in Western Europe, yeah. uh, in these uh, very sort of scientifically balanced uh, feeding operations where the animals are kept indoors. So they're like not Total wasting. mixed rations, as they call it. Right. TMR. TMR, or, total TMR. mixed rations. Uh -huh. uh, the animals are bred to grow and gain weight really fast. Yep. Uh, and fancy genetics. Fancy yep. genetics. Yep. These systems are really very efficient. And so uh, the animals grow much faster and it takes much less feed for them to create meat or milk okay. than old-fashioned extensive systems as we call them, so traditional systems in most of the world. Yeah. And then the third argument is the grazing argument, which is that people have noticed that grasslands yeah. can store carbon in the soil. Right. Yeah. And carbon obviously, if they're pulling carbon dioxide out of the air to put it in the soil, in the soil yeah. that's actually reducing our our greenhouse gases. Right. And so we want it say, in the soil, we don't want it in the air. If we base yeah. our <laughs> agriculture on grazing, we can actually mitigate climate change. All three of those arguments have some truth. All three of them have some problems. Oh, okay. So let's take take up the efficiency one. You're I think you're trying to tell me that it's not a simple matter that I can now go to McDonald's because I've read your book and have a McDonald's hamburger without guilt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so what are the problems with that efficiency argument? To my mind, the biggest problem with the efficiency argument mm -hmm. is that it's efficiency per pound of meat produced. We didn't become efficient because we were concerned about climate. We became efficient to bring down the cost. We were competing to make meat as cheaply as possible. Right. So efficient meat is also cheap meat. Mm -hmm. And cheap meat means people can eat too much of it, too much of it for their own health. And yeah. also, if you are producing it efficiently, but are producing twice as much because it's cheap and people are eating too much, throwing a bunch of it away because it's cheap, who cares? We can throw it away. Yeah. Uh, then mm. you actually haven't gained anything. Uh, okay. So that's the biggest drawback. Yeah, yeah. There are some other drawbacks um, one of which is to come up with their numbers about how good, relatively, um, 
modern industrial production is. Who's they? The, the advocates of the idea okay. that one of the solutions to the problem posed by greenhouse gas emissions of livestock agriculture is to just have everybody convert to doing efficient modern industrial production. Everybody, all livestock mm. should be raised in CAFOs. But the, 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 this is scientists, it's not just the right. Beef Producers right. Association right. Right. making right. up marketing stories. No, right? no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the scientists who write the papers yeah. that find that this is the best way to raise meat, yeah. one of the things they do is they start with the assumption that soil carbon is in equilibrium. So that scientific ration, those feed rations that are ideal for animals to gain weight really quickly, yeah. tend to be higher in grain. And grain is grown as an annual crop on soils. Yeah. And we know that those kinds of annual crops like corn and yeah. soybeans, uh, the soils tend to lose carbon over time. You've, added a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide to the air by yeah. plowing up that soil. Yeah. That matters. Right. But also it turns out that it's not true that these soils reach equilibrium. They may reach equilibrium. The carbon may sort of level off at whatever it is, 1% or 2% yeah. in the top five or six inches. But what we found with more recent research is that there's a very good chance that we will continue losing carbon from lower in the soil profile. Oh, okay. So yeah. even after yeah. they say, oh, it doesn't matter, we can yeah. continue to grow grain because the carbon's not changing in the top six inches, yeah. the carbon continues to change down 12 inches and okay. 24 inches. So in terms of carbon in the soil, we also have to think about where in the soil profile is the top versus the bottom and the different right. effects of the different and, systems. Right. How and about the grass-based system? How does that do? Oh, yes. Well, so that's the big reason why people say it's the solution. Okay. Is because <clears throat> in those top six inches, uh, the grass-based system very often winds up adding carbon, pulling it out of the air yep. and adding more carbon to those top six inches. Yep. One of the limitations is that grazing farmers, having heard some of this, think that, oh, I'm grazing, so I'm automatically adding lots of carbon to the soil. Oh. And okay, yeah, not necessarily. It depends on a lot of factors. Okay. Um, and we are still trying to understand what all those factors are. A grazing system, if it's managed at all well, yeah. is still going to do better on soil carbon than any kind of annual crop. Right, and you're also keeping the ground covered you're, all year round. You're keeping the ground. So you're cutting down on water pollution and soil erosion. Soil erosion. Yep. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. And is animal welfare better? Well, they're on a, on a people grass? argue about that. Okay. Uh, there are different aspects to animal welfare. It's yeah. not just one metric. So okay. when animals are grazing, one of the key things that uh, is improved about their welfare is they're allowed to express their natural behaviors. Yes. One of which yeah. is grazing. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, but uh, there, there can be downsides, right? It can be really hot out on pasture. Right, in the middle of and, summer. Yep. Yeah, in the middle of summer. Or and cold then, in the winter. Or cold in the winter. Mm -hmm. And whereas a dairy cow who is in a CAFO mm -hmm. has, is in a shed with fans, and there may be sprinklers keeping her cool in the summer. Mm -hmm. She has some shelter in the winter. Uh, so there are different dimensions. Um, but on the whole, I would, my personal belief uh -huh. is that uh, you you can arrange your grazing system so that you are providing some shelter or the option of shelter for your cows and that... What, by having some buildings close by? You can do that. Oh, okay. Uh, or you can do silvopasture. Silvopasture! Ah, put some trees out there too. Right, yep. which can okay. provide shade in the summer and yep. the wind break uh, in okay. the winter. Silvopasture? Yeah. Agroforestry, a variety of agroforestry right. is they call it. Right, yeah. uh, But... Side note here. Uh, her dissertation was about silver pasture. Yes, silver pasture is my particular passion. <laughs> but um, because you can you can give them that behavioral aspect of welfare, mm -hmm. and you can still manage carefully to provide those other aspects of welfare on pasture. Right. I think you're a little more challenged in a confinement system to provide that behavioral aspect of welfare, even though you can manage it for some of those other aspects.
Right. But we still have belching cows and we have all these kinds of other kinds of issues. So why do I, okay, I'm just, I'm not going to eat meat at all. Won't, won't, won't that resolve the problem? Well, and if that's something you want to do, mm -hmm. that's great. That okay. will contribute. There are a couple things I want you to keep in mind. Okay. One is that there's been a lot of talk about it's the most important thing you can do for the climate. But that's global, right? We in the uh, okay. United States, yeah. we eat a lot of meat, yeah. but we okay. also have a huge climate footprint in other ways. So in the U.S., yeah. all of agriculture yeah. accounts for about 10 to at most 12% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Whereas yeah. transportation yeah. counts for 27 to 28% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Oh, wow. So two and a half times as much. Right. Yeah. So yeah. in the U.S., <clears throat> say you took cut livestock out of your diet altogether, right? Mm -hmm. And you were a typical person who was eating a typical amount of meat, yeah. you could maybe reduce your overall carbon footprint by maybe eight, maybe even, maybe even 9% if you ate just a very, very careful yeah. diet of everything else and yeah. didn't indulge in anything like tropical fruits or anything like that. Oh, okay. Um, Coffee. But, right. Yeah, or chocolate. Chocolate. My, oh. my favorite. <laughs> But if you, if you reduced your plane travel by half and your driving by half, yeah. you would have a much bigger impact. If you change your light bulbs, you might have, you know, a, a pretty big impact. Elect electricity as as generation <clears throat> is huge. It's even bigger than transportation. Now, some of that electricity right. goes for manufacturing and sure. commercial uses, but a, a fair bit of it goes in our own private homes. And but I'm still doing something good if I give up meat yeah. from, the, from the climate, right? Yes, so... absolutely you are, and there okay. you have no moral obligation to eat meat. Okay. So you can do that. Yeah. I would say livestock plays a really important role in a, in a sustainable agriculture. Oh, so okay. So we do, there's a reason we have livestock. Every agricultural system around the world, even in parts of the world where many people are vegetarian, yeah. livestock play a really important role in supporting a sustainable agriculture. I know you've talked about organic agriculture. Yes, we had a whole and, module on yeah, it. Yeah, organic agriculture. Yeah doesn't allow the use of synthetic nitrogen. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. Right. Synthetic nitrogen is a big source of water pollution. Yeah. It, it takes a lot of energy to make it, the Haber-Bosch process. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. a bunch of issues there. Right. Yeah. And of course, nitrogen is can cause, well, can produce nitrous oxide, which uh -huh. is, of course, as we mentioned, a major greenhouse gas pollutant. Yeah. So... How do you add nitrogen in an organic system if you can't use synthetic nitrogen? Because the plants do need some to grow. Right. 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 So the way you do it is there is nitrogen in manure. And yeah. so you can add animal manure. Yeah. You, it's a little tricky and there's some details about that. Uh, but the other way you do it, and this is even more important, is you grow something called a green manure. Green manure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That could be something like alfalfa or clover. Those are kinds of plants that have a relationship with bacteria. Right. And the bacteria pull nitrogen out of the air and put it into the soil in a form that the plants can use. Oops. Yeah, but if I'm doing green manure, what do I need animals for? Right. What are you going to do with that green manure? Uh, how much alfalfa do you like to eat for dinner? Oh. So right. we can eat maybe a tiny bit of alfalfa as okay. young alfalfa sprouts, at which point they <laughs> won't have pulled any nitrogen into the soil, right? Okay, right. Humans basically can't eat these green manure crops. We can't uh, eat clover. We can't eat alfalfa. Yeah. You, you have to, to bring this nitrogen in the soil. You have to grow a lot of it. And uh, okay. livestock can eat these crops. And so right. they make it economically feasible to spend a year growing alfalfa or a year growing clover or field peas or whatever it is. Right, which also breaks up uh, pest cycles. It helps with the weed control. In exactly, exactly. Right. So they also yeah. make our agriculture much more diverse. Yeah, yeah.
So Diane, what I'm getting out of all of this is that there's something to be said for combining these systems or hybridizing them in some way, that they all have a little bit to offer and they can be a little bit synergistic with each other. Am I they, getting that right? They definitely all have a little bit to offer. I yeah. would say that the two parts of it is first, think about how you can improve within your system. Ah, yes. So if you are a conventional farmer with a, a concentrated animal feeding operation. KFOs, yep. KFOs, yep. yep. You, you can't on a dime switch to grazing. The bank won't let you. You've got right. too much money invested in your right. equipment, in your infrastructure, your buildings. So focus on doing the best job you can, growing your crops yep. in a way that, that protects your soils, maybe switching to no-till, may, maybe adding cover crops. Cover crops, yep. And then if you're open to it, yes, you've got a dairy farm, you know, yep. traditional dairy farm. Maybe you could graze your, your heifers. They, yep. For them, they're not producing milk. They can get right. adequate nutrition yep. on, on pasture. Yep. And a synergy here, if you're growing cover crops, to do a better job managing your soils, they could graze your cover crops and right. make that more okay. financially yep. viable, yep. right? Yep. So that's an example yep. of hybridizing those systems. Yep. Industrial getting something out of a grazing system. Right. Is there anything for a grazing to get anything out of industrial? Absolutely. Okay. So you can graze your animals and you can still supplement them with a little bit of grain. So there are actually uh -huh. quite a lot of, or all organic dairy farms are required to allow their cows to graze. But right. most of them will supplement with a little grain, and that's very important to keeping their production up. Yeah. So you, you're getting the benefits of managing most of your land in pasture, yeah. but you're boosting the production of your cows quite a lot with supplementing with a little grain. Okay. So. And how about the hybridizing with uh, sustainable agriculture systems that don't, where, where you don't eat meat? Well, what I would say is really, it. The hybrid part of it is that Depends some on. livestock can yeah. actually increase the sustainability of the uh -huh. agroecosystem overall. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing overall is that this is a complicated question. It is a complicated <laughs> question. So I think your yeah. overall question, right, was should I eat meat? Yeah. And kind of riffing on Michael Pollan's famous comment in, in defense of food, I would say... Oh, yeah. The answer to that is you should only eat meat if you want to. Okay. Not too much. Not too much, yeah. And ideally, you should know how that meat was made. Yeah. And then you can make an informed decision about the climate consequences, the water consequences, the wildlife consequences of that meat. And I can be reducing my own footprint. Your own carbon hoofprint, yes. <laughs> My own carbon hoofprint? Oh, okay. Or the, right. My carbon. Your carbon footprint, yes. <laughs> sure. Diane, thank you so much uh, for uh, visiting uh, with us here in the class. And uh, I'm really eager to see the book. I suspect you are too. <laughs> I'm even more eager to see the book. And why haven't you arranged for a few more elves to come out at night and do some more writing? <laughs> Yes, I think we would all want a few more elves in this world. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diane. Okay, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. Great.